Hello and welcome to Access Asia. I'm Chapegra. In the show this week, we'll take a closer look at climate change in Asia and its impact on extreme weather events, whether they're scorching heat waves in Pakistan or devastating floods in Bangladesh, the likelihood that these events occur is increasing along with global temperatures. Dr. Frederica Otto is an expert on extreme weather events and global warming. She shares her insights with us this week. First, let's get a clear sense of what an extreme weather event is and what its impact on people can be. In recent weeks, India and Bangladesh have experienced floods that have killed close to 200 people and displaced 7 million. Beyond these numbers, there are dire consequences for people's livelihoods, whether in rural areas or urban settings. Leo McGuinn has the details. Hundreds dead and millions displaced. As torrential rain and mass floods have caused devastation in parts of India and Bangladesh. In Assam state, to the northeast of India, the deluge has ruined livelihoods entire farms being submerged by water. All the houses here have been damaged by the floods. Our wheat, rice, hens, cows, everything has drowned. The farmlands have drowned too. The floods took away the fish from the fisheries. We're suffering every day and going through extreme difficulties to get food. For those displaced by the floods, they are taking shelter on roadsides, waiting for government aid. We don't even have enough rice left. The government did provide food aid twice, but it wasn't enough. The people here are in distress. All the land and fisheries are destroyed. We can barely survive. Those are the conditions here. It is not just rural areas that the rain has affected. In Mumbai, the country's most populous city, they are used to heavy rains during monsoon season, which lasts from June to September. But the intensity of this year's rainfall has caused havoc for businesses. The downpour has meant that many local shops lose out on customers. Uh, an entire day it rained heavily. We don't have even a single customer. So no business for the entire day, it rained heavily. Otherwise, in normal rain, people, they come walking is there. Otherwise, in heavy rain, walking is not there. So no customer, no business. Over the border in Bangladesh, in the city of Silet, things are just as bad. Despite water levels receding in major rivers across Bangladesh, the city remains partially submerged. According to a local official, people cannot afford to repair the damage inflicted by the floods. As an official, I'm responsible for 150 houses. All of them are mud houses and all have been damaged. These houses need immediate repair for people to live in them, but people don't have the money for repair works. Bangladesh is considered one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change in the world due to its low-lying nature. With nearly 75% of the country below sea level, some experts predict that by 2050, nearly a fifth of the country will be underwater. Dr. Friederike Otto is joining us live from London now. She's a senior lecturer at the Grantham Institute for Climate Change at Imperial College. She's also one of the co-leads of World Weather Attribution, an international effort to analyze whether climate change has had an effect on particular extreme weather events. Well, thanks for being with us on France 24. Hi. So Bangladesh uh, and Eastern India, as we saw in, in that uh, report, are especially prone to flooding and have always been. But what's the impact of climate change on these episodes of flooding we've seen recently? For flooding, actually, the question is not so straightforward to answer because, of course, flooding is uh, what happens after um, the water hit the ground and can have several uh, um, causes. So it can be extremely heavy rainfall that can fall over a short time. It can be changes in the monsoon circulation. But flooding can, of course, also occur um, due to um, if there is a heat wave, for example, higher up in the mountains. And so there is extremely rapid snow melt and flooding can occur um, when there, there are storm surges. And so the climate change signal um, and all of that is there, but how exactly it changes an individual flood event, 
very much depends on uh, the area in, in question. But what we do know, and what we also do see in these parts of the world is an increase in extreme heavy rainfall because of human-induced climate change. And you're talking about human-induced climate change, but uh, you know, from the solution sides, what can be done by authorities in these countries to better protect themselves and their population against such events? It's always, and um, that is not just the case for Bangladesh and India, but everywhere in the world, that those um, who are most vulnerable in, in every society are the ones most affected by those events. So it's people living in informal housing, particularly, um, and it's often people who have also least um, access to information. And so one of the key things to do is to improve early warning systems so that everyone knows when such flood events are going to be occur because they can usually be forecast quite well. But then also, of course, that they have places to go. And ultimately, of course, um, better housing, better infrastructure in, in cities is essential to save lives. So there's warning processes on one hand, there's also in investment in infrastructure uh, on the other. Uh, actually, the global north and, and developed countries had promised $100 billion a year to developing nations to cope with the effects of climate change. This, play, this pledge actually hasn't materialized so far, but could you give us a sense of what that final uh, financial injection could change uh, for, for developing countries? I think it's absolutely vital that uh, the Global North will will at least honour these pledges and provide that money. But of course, um, that alone, money alone, does not lead to good adaptation. Um, and what is really needed is to reduce vulnerability. And how that exactly looks like really depends on on the circumstances. So in 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 some places, it might be that. Um, improving governance and reducing corruption is the most important thing to actually um, make sure that that the money can can achieve something for the poor. In other places, it might really be that the governance is is good, but it is funding that is needed um, to to plan better better infrastructure or funding that is needed to invest in um, in good weather forecasts and better weather station networks. So, but all of that. Is, is needed. And that's, I think, why adaptation funding is really difficult, because the key thing to make adaptation work is really that it's embedded in local governance structures. And so working with um, these local governments is absolutely essential for adaptation to work. So we've uh, discussed floods, but heat waves are also a threat in that region. Pakistan, for instance, is uh, home to one of the world's now hottest cities, uh, Jacobabad. It has uh, recorded very high temperatures for several years, but this year the city saw up to 51 degrees at the peak of the heat wave in May. Our correspondents Shazai Bwala and Sonia Ghazali went there and sent us this report. The scorching heat becomes almost unbearable in Jacobabad. The temperature can go as high as 51 degrees centigrade. The city is one of the hottest in the world. People use different methods to cool off. But despite record temperatures, laborers on this construction site continue their work. Working in this heat is very difficult. Sometimes when I work, I get dizzy. I feel like my body is drained of all its energy. But I have no choice. If I don't earn money, I can't feed my family. I will continue to do this job as long as my body allows me to. Azizullah is paid 700 Pakistani rupees per day or about 3 euros for 8 hours of work. It's barely enough for him to feed his wife and three children. This is where we sleep. We only have one fan. There are often power cuts, and sometimes for six hours we don't have electricity. Then we have to use this hand fan. The heat combined with high humidity makes life almost unbearable. Heat strokes due to high temperatures are common. What's happening to you? Do you feel dizzy? Were you outside? Did you get the heat? 
These days, we mainly have patients who are victims of sunstroke. They have gastroenteritis. Their blood pressure is low because of the heat. We advise everyone to take precautions in this time. If you have to work, you should go early in the morning and should avoid going outside or working in the afternoon when it's very warm. But Jakobabad faces many challenges. The city is one of the poorest in the country. Here, the drinking water is in the hands of a water mafia, and the local population is forced to pay for it. Shazai Bwala reporting from Pakistan there. Uh, returning to our interview with uh, Dr. Friedrich Otto, actually, the world weather att attribution on that heat wave experienced by India and Pakistan uh, in May, um, that report shows that climate change actually made this episode 30 times more likely. Um, can you explain this conclusion to us? So that, that means that an event that is still relatively rare and exceptional would have been really a very extreme and very rare event without climate change. And what we also know is that because climate change, of course, isn't stopping tomorrow, we are still globally burning fossil fuels and emissions are continuing to rise rather than fall. So. Uh, in a warmer climate, these kind of events will happen even more frequently. Actually, and take, taking a step back, actually, data from the Global Carbon Project shows that Asia as a whole uh, is the biggest source of CO2 emissions globally. Where would you say are emission reduction efforts uh, on the continent these days? And are these efforts enough? I think it's important to put this in a historical context that, that today the emissions uh, of in Asia are highest, but of course, historically, they have been extremely high and, and highest from, from also the US and Europe and the atmosphere um, cares about the concentration of CO2, not the emissions. So it's, it's not just Asia's job. Um, but of course, um, Asia needs to also reduce emissions and I think uh, while India has um, been really good to focus on adaptation and, and early warning systems for their population, um, they are still burning a lot of coal and uh, no, exporting coal. And um, that makes these heat waves worth, worse. And that, of course, that needs to change globally. We need globally net zero, including all countries in the world. Dr. Friederike Otto is a senior lecturer at uh, the Grantham Institute for Climate Change at, uh, e at Imperial College. Thank you very much for being with us uh, on Access Asia. Thanks for having me. And that's it uh, for our show this week, but do stay tuned for more programming right here on France 24.